Section 8 of The Rider on the White Horse by Theodor Storm. Translated by Margarete Münsterberg. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Avaii in October 2013. Thus summer and autumn had passed, and until toward the end of November the work had been continued. Then frost and snow had put a stop to the labours, and it was decided to leave the land that was to be diked in open. Eight feet the dike rose above the level of the land. Only where the lock was to be made on the west side toward the water, a gap had been left. The channel up in front of the old dike had not yet been touched. So the flood could make its way into the enclosed land without doing it or the new dike either any great damage. And this work of human hands was entrusted to the great God and put under his protection until the spring sun should make possible its completion. In the meantime, a happy event had been expected in the house of the dike master. In the ninth year of his marriage, a child had been born. It was red and shriveled and weighed seven pounds, as newborn children should when they belong, as this one did, to the female sex. Only its crying was strangely muffled and did not please the wise woman. The worst of all was that on the third day Elke was seized with high childbed fever, was delirious and recognized neither her husband nor her old helper. The unbounded joy that had come over Hauke at the sight of his child had turned into sorrow. The doctor from the city was called. He sat at her bedside and felt her pulse and looked about helplessly. Hauke shook his head. He won't help. Only God can help. He had thought out a Christianity of his own, but there was something that kept back his prayer. When the old doctor had driven away, Hauke stood by the window, staring out into the wintry day, and while the patient was screaming in her delirium, he folded his hands. He did not know whether he did so in devotion, or so as not to lose himself in his terrible fear. "'The sea! The sea!' wailed the patient. "'Hold me!' she screamed. "'Hold me, Hauke!' Then her voice sank. It sounded as if she were crying. Out on the sea, on the wide sea. Oh, God, I'll never see him again. Then he turned round and pushed the nurse from the bed. He fell on his knees, clasped his wife, and drew her to his heart. Elke, Elke, don't you know me? I am with you. But she only opened wide her eyes, glowing with fever, and looked about as if hopelessly lost. He laid her back on her pillows, then he pressed his hands together convulsively. "'Lord, my God!' he cried. "'Don't take her from me. Thou knowest I cannot live without her.' Then it seemed as if a thought came to him, and he added in a lower voice, I know well thou canst not always do as thou wouldst, not even thou. Thou art all wise, thou must act according to thy wisdom. O Lord, speak to me through a breath. It seemed as if there were a sudden calm. He only heard low breathing. When he turned to the bed he saw his wife lying in a quiet sleep, and the nurse looking at him with horrified eyes. He heard the door move. Who was that? he asked. Sir, the maid Angrete went out. She had brought in the warming pan. Why do you look at me so in such confusion, Madame Levke? I? I was frightened by your prayer. With that you can't pray death away from anybody. Hauke looked at her with his penetrating eyes. Do you too, like our Angrete, go to the conventicle at the Dutch tailor Jantjes? Yes, sir, we both have the living faith. Hauke made no reply. The practice of holding seceding conventicles, which at that time was in full swing, had also blossomed out among the Frisians. Down and out artisans and schoolmasters dismissed as drunkards played the leading parts, and girls, young and old women, lazy and lonely people went eagerly to the secret meetings at which anybody could play the priest. 
of the dikemaster's household angrete and the servant boy in love with her spent their free evenings there to be sure elke had not concealed her doubtful opinion of this from hauke but he had said that in matters of faith one ought not to interfere with any one this could not hurt anybody and it was better to have them go there than to the inn for whisky so he had let it be and so he had kept silent even now but to be sure people were not silent about him the words of his prayer were spread from house to house he had denied the omnipotence of god what was a god without omnipotence he was a denier of god that affair with the devil's horse may have something in it after all hauke heard nothing of all this his ears and eyes were open only for his wife in these days even his child did not exist for him any more the old doctor came again came every day sometimes twice then stayed a whole night again wrote a prescription and even jones swiftly rode with it to the apothecary but finally the doctor's face grew more cheerful and he nodded confidentially to the dikemaster she'll pull through she'll pull through with god's help and one day whether it was because his skill had conquered her illness or because in answer to hauke's prayer god had been able after all to find a way out of his trouble when the doctor was alone with the patient he spoke to her while his old eyes smiled lady now i can safely say to you to-day the doctor has his gala day things looked very darkly for you but now you belong to us again to the living then a flood of light streamed out of her dark eyes hauke hauke where are you she cried and when in response to her loud cry he rushed into the room and to her bed she flung her arms round his neck hauke my husband saved i can stay with you then the old doctor pulled his silk handkerchief out of his pocket wiped his forehead and cheeks with it and nodding left the room on the third evening after this day a pious speaker it was a slipper-maker who had once been dismissed by the dikemaster spoke at the conventicle held at the dutch tailors where he explained to his audience the attributes of god but he who denies the omnipotence of god who says i know thou canst not as thou wouldst we all know the unhappy man he weighs like a stone on the community he has fallen off from god and seeks the enemy of god the friend of sin as his comforter for the hand of man has to lean upon some staff but you beware of him who praised us his prayer is a curse this too was spread from house to house what is not spread in a small community and it reached hauke's ears he said no word about it not even to his wife but sometimes he would embrace her violently and draw her to himself stay faithful elke stay faithful to me then her eyes would look up at him full of wonder faithful to you to whom else should i be faithful after a short while however she had understood his words yes hauke we are faithful to each other not only because we need each other then each went his and her way to work so far all would have been well but in spite of all the lively work a loneliness had spread round him and in his heart nestled a stubbornness and a reserved manner toward other people only toward his wife he was always the same and every evening and every morning he knelt at the cradle of his child as if there he could find the place of his eternal salvation toward servants and workmen however he grew more severe the clumsy and careless ones whom he used to instruct with quiet reproaches were now startled by his harsh address and sometimes elke had to make things right quietly where he had offended when spring came work on the dike began again the gap in the western dike line was closed by a temporary dike half moon shaped on the inside and the same toward the outside for the protection of the new lock about to be made 
and as the log grew, so the chief dike gradually acquired its height, which could be more and more quickly attained. The work of directing was not any easier for the dike master, as in place of Jewe Manners, Ole Peters had stepped in as dike overseers. Hauke had not cared to attempt preventing this, but now in place of the encouraging word and the corresponding friendly slap on the shoulder that he had earned from his wife's old godfather, he had to cope with the successor's secret hostility and unnecessary objections which had to be thwarted with equally unnecessary reasons. For Ole belonged to the important people, to be sure, but not to the clever ones in dike matters. Besides, the scribbling hired man of former days was still in his way. The brightest sky again spread over sea and marshes, and the enclosed land was once more gay with strong cattle, the bellowing of which from time to time interrupted the widespread calm. Larks sang continually high in the air, but one was not aware of it until for the time of a heartbeat the singing had ceased. No bad weather disturbed the work, and the lock was ready with its unpainted structure of beams before it needed the protection of the temporary dike for even one night. The Lord seemed to favor the new work. Then Elke's eyes would laugh to greet her husband when he came home from the dike on his white horse. You did turn into a good animal, he said, and he patted the horse's smooth neck. But when he saw the child clinging round her neck, Hauke leaped down and let the tiny thing dance in his arms. Then, when the white horse would fix its brown eyes on the child, he would say, Come here, you shall have the honor. And he would place little Wienke, for that was her Christian name, on the saddle and lead the white horse round in a circle on the hill. The old ash tree, too, sometimes had the honor. He would set the child on a swinging bow and let it rock. The mother stood in the house door with laughing eyes. But the child did not laugh. Her eyes, between which there was a delicate little nose, looked a little dully into the void, and her little hands did not try to seize the small stick that her father was holding for her to take. Hauke did not pay attention to this, especially as he knew nothing about such little children. Only Elke, when she saw the bright-eyed girl on the arm of her charwoman, who had been confined at the same time with her, sometimes said with regret, Mine isn't as far on as yours yet, Trina. And the woman, as she shook the chubby boy she held by the hand with brusque love, would cry, Yes, madam, children are different. This one here, he stole apples out of my room before he was more than two years old. And Elke pushed the chubby boy's curls from his eyes, and then secretly pressed her quiet child to her heart. At the beginning of October, the new lock stood solidly at the west side in the main dike, now closed on both sides. Except for the gaps by the channel, the new dike now sloped all the way round with a gentle profile toward the water, and rose above the ordinary high tide by fifteen feet. From the northwestern corner, one could look unhindered past Jeva's island out over the sea. But to be sure, the winds blew more sharply here, one's hair fluttered, and he who wanted a view from this point had to have his cap securely on his head. Toward the end of November, when storm and rain had set in, there remained only one gap to close, the one hard by the old dike, at the bottom of which the seawater shot through the channel into the new enclosure. At both sides stood the walls of the dike, now the cleft between them had to vanish. Dry summer weather would have made the work easier, but it had to be done anyway, for a rising storm might endanger the whole work and Hauke staked everything on accomplishing the end. Rain poured down, the wind whistled, but his lean figure on the fiery white horse rose now here, now there, out of the black masses of people who were busy by the gap, above and below, on the north side of the dike. Now he was seen below beside the dump carts that already had to go far on the foreland to get the clay, a crowded lot of these had just reached the channel in order to cast off their loads. 
Through the splashing of the rain and the roaring of the wind, from time to time sounded the sharp orders of the dikemaster, who wanted to rule here alone today. He called the carts according to their numbers and ordered back those that were crowding up. When his stop sounded, then all work ceased. Straw, send down a load of straw, he called to those above, and the straw from one of their loads came tumbling down onto the wet clay. Below, men jumped about in it and tore it apart and called up to the others that they did not want to be buried. Again new carts came, and Hauke was up on top once more and looked down from his white horse into the cleft below and watched them shovel and dump their loads. Then he glanced out over the sea. The wind was sharp, and he saw how the edge of the water was climbing higher up the dike, and that the waves rose still higher. He saw, too, that the men were drenched and could scarcely breathe during their hard work because of the wind which cut off the air right before their mouths, and because of the cold rain that was pouring down on them. "'Hold out, men, hold out!' he shouted down to them. "'Only one foot higher, then it'll be enough for this flood!' And through all the raging of the storm one could hear the noise of the workmen, the splashing of the masses of clay tumbling down, the rattling of the carts and the rustling of the straw let down from above went on unceasingly. In the midst of these noises, now and then, the wailing of a little yellow dog could be heard, which, shivering and forlorn, was knocked about among all the men and teams. Suddenly a scream of anguish from the little animal rose out of the cleft. Hauke looked down, he had seen the dog hurled down from above. His face suddenly flushed with rage. Stop! Stop! he shouted down to the carts, for the wet clay was being heaped up unceasingly. Why? a rough voice bawled up from below. Not on account of that wretched brat of a dog. Stop, I say! Hauke shouted again. Bring me the dog. I don't want any crime done with our work. But not a hand stirred. Only a few spades full of tough clay were still thrown beside the howling animal. Then he spurred his white horse so that it uttered a cry and stormed down the dike, and all gave way before him. The dog! he shouted. I want the dog! A hand slapped his shoulder gently, as if it were the hand of old Jewe Manners, but when Hauke looked round he saw that it was only a friend of the old man's. "'Take care, Dykemaster,' he whispered to him. "'You have no friends among these people. Let this dog business be.' The wind whistled, the rain splashed, the men had stuck their spades into the ground, some had thrown them away. Hauke bent down to the old man. Do you want to hold my horse, Harke Jens? he asked, and the latter scarcely had the reins in his hand when Hauke had leaped into the cleft and held the little wailing animal in his arms. Almost in the same moment he sat high in his saddle again and galloped back to the dike. He glanced swiftly over the men who stood by the teams. Who was it? he called. Who threw down this creature? For a moment all was silent, for rage was flashing from the face of the dikemaster, and they had a superstitious fear of him. Then a muscular fellow stepped down from a team and stood before him. I didn't do it, dikemaster, he said, bit off a piece from his roll of tobacco and calmly pushed it into his mouth before he went on. But he who did it did right. If your dike is to hold, something alive has to be put into it. Something alive? From what catechism have you learnt that? From none, sir, replied the fellow with a pert laugh. Our grandfathers knew that, who, I am sure, were as good Christians as you. A child is still better. If you can't get that, a dog will do. You keep still with your heathen doctrines, Hauke shouted at him. The hole would be stopped up better if you had been thrown into it. Ho, ho! sounded from a dozen throats, and the dikemaster saw grim faces and clenched fists round him. He saw that these were no friends. The thought of his dike came over him like a sudden fear. What would happen if now all should throw down their spades? 
As he glanced down, he again saw the friend of old Jewe Manners, who walked in and out among the workmen, talked to this one and that one, smiled at one, slept another on the shoulder with a pleasant air, and one after another took up his spade again. After a few minutes the work was in full swing. What was it that he still wanted? The channel had to be closed, and he hid the dog safely in the folds of his cloak. With a sudden decision, he turned his white horse to the next team. Let down the straw, he called despotically, and the teamster obeyed mechanically. Soon it rustled down into the depth, and on all sides all arms were stirring again. This work lasted an hour longer. It was six o'clock, and deep twilight was descending. The rain had stopped. Then Hauke called the superintendents together beside his horse. Tomorrow morning at four o'clock, he said, everybody is to be in his place. The moon will still be shining, then we'll finish with God's blessing. And one thing more, he cried when they were about to go. Do you know this dog? And he took the trembling creature out of his cloak. They did not know it. Only one man said, it has been begging round the village for days. He belongs to nobody. Then he is mine said the dikemaster. Don't forget, tomorrow morning at four o'clock. And he rode away. When he came home, Angrete stepped out of the door. She had on neat clothing, and the thought shot through his head that she was going to the conventicle tailor's. Hold out your apron, he called to her, and as she did so automatically, he threw the little dog, all covered with clay, into the apron. Carry him in to little Winke, he is to be her companion. But wash and warm him first, then you'll do a good deed too that will please God, for the creature is almost frozen. And Angrete could not help obeying her master, and therefore did not get to the conventicle that day. The next day the last cut with the spade was made on the new dike. The wind had gone down, gulls and other seabirds were flying back and forth over land and water in graceful flight. From Yeva's island one could hear like a chorus of a thousand voices the cries of the wild geese that still were making themselves at home on the coast of the North Sea, and out of the white morning mists that spread over the white marshes gradually rose a golden autumn day and shed its light on the new work of human hands. After a few weeks the commissioners of the ruler came with the dikemaster general for inspection. A great banquet, the first since the funeral banquet of old Tede Falkerts, was given in the house of the dikemaster, to which all the dike overseers and the greater landowners were invited. After dinner all the carriages of the guests and of the dikemaster were made ready. The dikemaster general helped Elke into the carriage in front of which the brown horse was stamping his hoofs. Then he leaped in after her and took the reins himself, for he wanted to drive the clever wife of his dikemaster himself. Then they rode merrily from the hill down to the road, then up to the new dike, and upon it all round the new enclosed land. In the meantime a light northwest wind had risen, and the tide was driven against the north and west sides of the new dike but one could not help being aware of the fact that the gentle slope made the attack of the water gentler, and praise was poured on the new dikemaster from the lips of the ruler's commissioners, so that the objections which now and then were slowly brought out by the overseers were soon stifled by it. This too passed by, but the dikemaster received another satisfaction one day as he rode along on the new dike in quiet, self-conscious meditation. The question naturally arose in his mind why the new enclosure, which would not have had its being without him, into which he had put the sweat of his brow and his night watches, now finally was named after one of the princesses, the new Caroline land. But it was so. On all the documents concerned with it stood the name, on some even in red Gothic letters. Then, just as he was looking up, he saw two workmen coming toward him with their tools, the one about twenty paces behind the other. Why don't you wait? He heard the one behind calling. The other, who was just standing by a path which led down into the new land, called to him. 
Another time, Jens, I'm late. I have to dig clay here. Where? Down here in the Hauke Haien land. He called it aloud as he trotted down the path as if he wanted the whole marsh below to hear it. But Hauke felt as if he were hearing his fame proclaimed. He rose from the saddle, spurred on his horse, and with steady eyes looked over the wide land that lay to his left. Hauke Haienland, Hauke Haienland, he repeated softly. That sounded as if in all time it could not have another name. Let them defy him as they would. They could not get round his name. The name of the princess... Wouldn't that soon moulder in old documents? His white horse galloped proudly, and in his ears he heard a murmur, Hauke Haienland, Hauke Haienland. In his thoughts the new dyke almost grew into the eighth wonder of the world. In all Phrygia there was not the like of it. And he let the white horse dance, for he felt as if he were standing in the midst of all the Phrygians, towering over them by the height of a head, and glancing down upon all, keenly and full of pity. End of section 8